The next day dawns in a similar state of silence. Millie rushes up to school before I finish shaving in the bathroom mirror. My fingers slip when I hold the razor and I cut myself. It's only a shallow cut, but it takes me by surprise. I swear under my breath. Sally doesn't comment it on at the breakfast table. Maybe she doesn't notice, or if she does, she doesn't care. But it stings like a bitch. We sit there, Sally and I, picking at our cereal like baby birds. We don't say a single thing. The rustle of Sally's newspaper breaks the silence alongside the steady tick-tick-ticking of the clock. But that's it. We could be in a silent movie, but one of us must place the intertitle cards. My existence feels just as black and white, dull and monotonous. Is this really all there is to life? Seen at the breakfast table with your wife, who you used to love, now you're not sure if you even like, while your teenage daughter tries steadfastly to ignore you. So yeah, I've been trying to keep track of what the girl's age is, but I'm not sure on that. They just said she's not in primary school anymore, so... Hmm. I sigh. In the quiet kitchen, the noise is almost overwhelming. It's lunchtime. I can hear the students. Though, when I say students, I really mean children running around outside in the playing field screaming. I sigh. I don't know how many times I've done that today. Far too many to count. Why do they have to make so much noise? I know it must get dull sitting in class for hours on end, but the work they do is hardly taxing. They're in primary school. I suppose there's no reason with young children. They're all like that. Noisy, raucous, excitable. It's the ones who aren't. The quiet, taciturn ones who sit in corners with their heads bowed and don't clamor for the castanets you have to look out for. I sigh again. You'd think the sound of children at play would fill me with a certain sense of fatherly fulfillment, but it doesn't. Instead, it's mildly irritating. And the irritation is becoming less and less mild with every passing moment. The music room juts out of the main building like an ugly afterthought, of so non appendage of Frankensteinian origins. You can hear the children more loudly than ever from here. It doesn't hold that so hot. I feel like I'm going to suffocate. The weather's been particularly merciless lately. Scorchy in the morning, freezing at night. Oh well, I'm a grown man. I'll just have to deal with it. I don't usually spend my lunch hour holding in my classroom like a recluse. Though social anxiety may run in my family, thank you, Grandma Iris, for passing those unwanted alleles down to my melly. I'm not what you would call shy. Maybe that comes down to experience. You stop being anxious when you get older. Sooner or later, you start to realize other people's opinions don't matter all that much. That's what I told Melly once. She replied, her head hanging, her voice muted. Is that why you and Mom were always shouting then? She wasn't trying to get at me. I don't think she was anyway. She was just asking a question. Her voice is even more defeated than her hunched posture. I didn't know how to reply to her, so I didn't say anything. That's a running theme in our relationship. Silence. I wish the kids outside would shut up. Sounds like World War III out there. How can I tune the piano like this? It's not like the kids will even appreciate it. If only they actually cared about music. Things might be slightly more bearable then. Unfortunately, they, much like everybody else in the world, to be honest, seem to think music's a DOS subject. A joke. Not even five-year-olds take me seriously. Oh well. That's part and parcel of being a music teacher. At least I don't teach RE. I continue to fiddle with the inner workings of the piano. It's a battered old thing that's been at the school even longer than I have. Tuning it always takes ages. It's like a battle of wits. Man versus music. I had a better luck trying to hack into the Kremlin. You really, really need a new piano. I've told the headmistress enough times, but she just shrugs off my concerns. Says there isn't enough room in the budget for such frivolous overspending. Frivolous? Okay, sure. You try teaching music with one barely functional piano and see how that goes. 99% of the time, it doesn't. No wonder everybody thinks music is a joke. I think it's a joke too, but not a very funny one. Not for me. Why? Fancy seeing you here. Uh... I lift my head, wiping my brow with the back of my arm. I recognize that voice. It's as airy as chiffon cake with a teasing inflection. So I didn't hear her. I'm torn between being a
impressed by her stealthy entry and perturbed. I'm sure there are more lane-like ways to enter a building. Could she use the door? No way, that's boring. You'll be in trouble if you get caught. You might be mistaken for a burglar. A burglar? Yeah, right. What self-respecting burglar is going to break into a primary school music room? What is there in here to steal anyway? I suppose it's a fair point. I know, I'm full of them. Belle stands by the now open window, curtains fly in the breeze as though she belongs here. Her skirt dances around her thighs. So, real quick, I think the music just went up again, so... The whole music thing is starting to annoy the hell out of me, I'm not gonna lie. and strikes a pose. Yes, do you like it? It's a school uniform. The St. Catherine's uniform. I know, it's cute, right? I like the plaid skirt. I look her up and down, arms folded and eyes narrowed like a real teacher. Well, I am a real teacher, so that isn't an act. Sometimes I almost forget myself. They'd never let you into St. Catherine's looking like that. Oh, why not? It's because I'm so devilishly good looking. It's because your skirt is far too short. It should only be a few inches above your knees, not a whole foot. My, my. I'm so glad you noticed. So here's the next CG. It's a little hard not to. So, do you think I'm sexy? You can't tear your eyes away from my beautiful thighs, is that it? I'm just trying to look out for your modesty. You want to play at being the Galleon Knight, protecting your fair lady's honor? How touching. I never said you were a fair lady. That might be true. Not with this hair. She pinches a few strands of her hair between her fingers. It's pitch black against her white skin. Tar spilled across snow. A dark lady, then? Doesn't that sound romantic? I'm not going to dignify that with an answer. Meaning, you're no fun. After I got all dressed up for you, too. Yes, quite. And where did you get that uniform from, exactly? I already suspect I know the answer, but... Same. You humans are so cute. You have such funny questions. What do you mean by that? I mean, I can conjure a human body for myself out of nothingness, but you're asking me about my clothes? Fitting together all the bones of my fingers, the muscles behind my eyes, the cells that circulate through my blood is the hard part. The wrapping paper and ribbons that go all around that is easy. I can do it in my sleep. It's a fair point. Crafting clothes from thin air does sound a lot easier than summoning a living, breathing human body. Bill twirls arms at her side, examining her uniform. Her far too short skirt flutters. I'm just struggling to understand why. Why what? Why you decide to wear a school uniform of all things? Do you really need to ask? Bill's eyes flash mischievously. It's because guys find it appealing. You do, don't you? kind of conversation. That's what you say, but I know otherwise. The schoolgirl's outfit is more than just a uniform. It's a symbol of youth, and old men like it when young girls pay attention to them. It makes them feel wanted, needed, attractive. Right? I turned my head away. I should be tuning the piano. I have a class in half an hour, and I don't know what I'll do if I can't tune the piano. Maybe I'll forgo my grandiose plans and bust out the maracas instead. Little children like making noise. They probably enjoy that more than trying to wobble through the lords by shepherd all out of tune out of time. Ooh, a piano. Fortunately, it seems the presence of this battered old Steinway has made Belle forget her previous line of inquiry. And that's a good thing, too. There is a time and a place to discuss one's sexual fantasies at lunch break in the music room primary school, no less, is not one of them. I'm more professional than that. Belle crosses the room in five neat steps, her silly skirt fluttering, and takes a seat on the stool by the piano. Now, what is she playing at? You can play the piano. Of course. I'm a very accomplished spirit. Well, good luck playing this one. It's ancient. I was in the middle of tuning it when a certain subway happened to climb through the window and distract me. Really? How rude of them. They sound like a very naughty girl. They are. Fast becoming the bane of my 
existence. Well, I've always been of the opinion that naughty girls should be punished. Unfortunately, corporal punishment has been illegal for a long, long time. We're living in the 21st century now. What a pity. And I do so love being scolded. Belle sighs and shrugs her shoulders, but the teasing smile on her face doesn't waver. Oh well. What can you do? If I can't be scolded properly in the manner to which I'm accustomed, at least I can be praised. And there you go. And with that, Belle gets to her feet and begins to peer inside the piano, and its exposed innards as it were. I wonder if the piano were a living, breathing creature, whether it would find this monthly tuning exercise of being opened up and invaded by unfamiliar fingers deeply embarrassing. said than done, especially given Belle's laying over the piano, her short skirt displaying a generous, some might say over-generous, amount of her behind. When she shifts, pressing her pale fingers across against the strings, I can see her underwear in stark detail. Is she doing this on purpose? I never knew the tuning a piano to be so interesting. I used to find the job incredibly dull. And so it zooms in closer. The subtle bulge of her thighs, constrained by her socks, looks even more appealing like this. It's almost as though she's inviting wandering fingers. Maybe she is. It can be no coincidence that she keeps turning over shoulders, shimmy glances, blinking from underneath her long, smoky lashes. I take a step backwards. Why am I still looking? I should stop looking. She's only tuning a piano, for Christ's sake. You could make a decent porn out of that, could you? Belle's trying. She's trying her best, and it's goddamn working, too. Fuck. I need to say something. The atmosphere is becoming unbearable. Not even the sound of the kids playing outside, little monsters, all of them, can alleviate the pounding of my head, the twitching of my fingertips. So, uh, you know how to tune a piano, too? Of course. I'm a spirit of many talents. And where did you pick that one up? Who knows? It's a secret. Like your age. Indeed, a lady never tells. For all you know, I could have been Marie Jantonette in a past life, eating cake and drinking tea. Whilst the rest of France only starved to death, right? But of course, I've always been selfish ever since I was born. When I find something I like, I detest the thought of sharing it with anyone. Belle looks at me, her eyes narrowed. Her eyes seem harsher under the sunlight somehow than they were last night. I swallow. I'm not so dense that I can't realize that was a threat. I better not bring the bell back home and meet Sally and Millie then. Not that I was planning on it. Can you imagine how awkward that would be? Hey there, Sally and Millie. I want to introduce you to somebody very special. This is Belle, my aunt, great Aunt Clarice's cat. My attempt to save her when I was only six and has now returned to thank me for the favor with her body. Please, don't be too alarmed. Well, Sally's eyes would probably widen so much they'd roll right out of her head. And as for Melly, I'm not sure how Melly would react. I never am these days. I shake my head. This is a waste of time. Forget it. It's not going to happen anyway. You were never Marie Antoinette. I doubt the Queen of France would ever have to tune her own piano. Indeed, I never did. Now I was Marie Antoinette, at least. You should thank me for degrading myself in such a manner for your sake, Robin. I glance back at her legs, her thighs, and her underwear. I think you're degrading yourself in a number of other ways. It's meant to be a skirt, not a belt. And now you sound like a concerned father. That's because I am a father. I'd never let Melly go out dressed like this. You say that, but I wonder. Parents don't know their children as well as they'd like to think. You're not all that close to Melody, are you? Uh, I blink. I was just playing around, I think. But Belle's words have stopped me, frozen in place like a figure in a photograph. What does she know about Melody? All right, there we go, all done. With that exclamation, Belle sits down the wooden piano cover once again hiding the delicate assembly of strings within. I raise an eyebrow. Awfully fast. Oh, are you doubting the quality of my?
my handiwork, my good sir. I was once crowned Queen of France. I must admit, I am a little dubious. If you really can't tune a piano as fast as you claim, I'll be out of a job. Well, that's just how it goes the cut the cutthroat world of work. They always want newer people, younger people, people with bright eyes and fast fingers who work harder for less pay and don't understand their rights. I sigh. Bell's right. I've noticed an alarming trend lately which has been sweeping through the school these past few years. A number of the teachers, good teachers, men and women I was on friendly small talk terms with are being laid off. First it was Mrs. Long, then Mr. Garland, then Mr. Potts. It can't be any coincidence that these men and women were all in their mid-fifties or even older. The people hired to replace them and were so young they could have only been a few years older than Melly, fresh from finishing their PGCEs. I have no idea what this is, but I assume it's some sort of like British teacher licensing board type thing or something along those lines. It's a wonder the kids listen to them at all. They're not much older than the kids themselves. The school doesn't feel like a school to me. Not anymore. It's more like a nursery. I go into the staff room to escape being pawed and mauled by the children. Not confront not confronted with even more of them. I have no doubts in a handful of years I'll be laid off too. Replaced with some trendy young boy or girl who insists upon being called by their first name and likes listening to oh, I don't know. Skill Skrillex. You can't even read sheet music. You have a point, but I'd rather not talk about it. It's depressing. I see, I see. The looming prospect of unemployment is always a toughie, huh? Especially when you have a wife and daughter. They don't make things easy, do they? It's no wonder you resent them. Especially when you're trying so, so hard, but they never seem to realize. I wince. My head pounds. She's right again. It's almost as though she can see right through me, peering, peering inside the recesses of my skull, and pulling up all the different wires within. I'm suddenly struck by a frightening thought. What if she knows me even better than I know myself? That's just humans for you though, huh? Ungrateful through and through. You get too old, and you get tossed aside like a ratty cardigan. Sure, they'll hand out the usual platitudes. I'm sorry to let you go. You were an invaluable asset to our team. But they don't mean it. It means nothing, especially if they hang you out to dry like that. People always say things they don't mean. It's just manners, and manners don't cost a penny. I can't stand for niceness for the sake of niceness. It's so tawdry. I feel my fingers clenching the fists at my side. I'm trembling. I wish I wasn't. Maybe Belle can sense my fear. I already said I don't want to talk about it. Sales ran a hair, uh, hand through her short hair. Suit yourself, I guess. Being a queen in past life, I, can, I can't understand your petty pedestrian worries. They're unsuited to a noble figure such as I. Now, would a noble figure really wear a skirt that short? People would faint if they saw so much as an exposed ankle back in the heyday of Madame Antoinette. And that's precisely why I want to dress like this. Experimenting with new fashion trends is exciting. A schoolgirl uniform is hardly a fashion trend. I pause, pondering. And Marie Antoinette was also made redundant, wasn't she? In the worst way possible. Indeed. But I was dignified to the last. I did not scream or cry, not even when my head was on the chopping block. It would have been far too unladylike. Well, color me impressed. I don't think I would be able to handle being executed with such good sportsmanship. It takes practice. Years of training. Don't worry, Robin. I'm sure you'll get there. I'd rather not if it's all the same to you. I quite like my head being attached to my neck. I quite like your head, too. You're cute. I'm not sure about that. We exchange brief glances, and then we both start to laugh. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's because the situation is so ridiculous. The two of us hold up inside the music classroom like fugitives hiding from the rest of the world. Right now, I can almost believe Belle is my whole world. Almost. Nor for the sound of the children playing outside, that is. So, Robin, aren't you curious? Do you want to see what a good job I did? About the piano, you mean? That's right. Why don't we play together? That might be nice. It's been a while since I played with anybody else. Even though you teach piano? Even 
so mostly I just sit and listen to my students. But I don't get a chance to play very much myself. Did you ever try to teach Melody? I did, for a brief amount of time, but Melody didn't like it. She wasn't built for it. You mean she has stubby little fingers? She wasn't physically unsuited, it was more... mentally, I suppose. She didn't have the knack. No staying power. It's sad. I really did want Melody to learn how to play the piano. It wasn't just some passing whim. It was my dream. Maybe it was because of Grandfather. He was the one who taught me how to play the piano all those years ago, back when I was five. He was a patient tutor who offered me words of encouragement. At the end of each lesson, he'd give me a fruit gum as a reward. I never saw playing the piano as a burden, though. I'm sure lots of children made to learn instruments, too. It was fun. I thought it was. I looked forward to every single lesson. I especially enjoyed it when Grandfather would play alongside me. I thought those duets were played played together were beautiful. I think that's supposed to be we played together were beautiful. They were a way for the two of us to communicate on a level deeper than words. I guess that's why I want to teach music. Like most people who experience something unforgettable in their youth, I wanted nothing more than to share my feelings with others. I wanted to share with my daughter, my melody. But it didn't work out like that. I don't have grandfather's patience, and Melly had no desire to learn. She hated the piano and always complained when it was time for her lessons. Not like Belle. Belle sits on the edge of the stool, leaving enough space for me to join her with an unexpected look on her face. She wants me to play with her. Somebody actually wants me to play with them. Now, when was the last time that happened? I haven't felt wanted like this for years. Alright then, let's see what you can do. In my sleeves, an unabashed smile tugging at my lips. It's the kind of smile that's impossible to suppress, just like the laughter that threatens to erupt at inopportune moments. I take a seat by Belle on the stool, facing the scratched old Steinway. The stool is small, and I can feel Belle's side pressed against mine. For all her talk about being a spirit, her body is warm and inviting, reassuringly human. What do you want to play? I like Debussy. that song, right? I don't actually know this one, The Little Room. Of course I know it. I haven't played the piano for more than 30 years. Please have some faith in me. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot you were such an old man. Not as old as you. Touché. You primary school teachers nowadays, you have such sharp tongues. I suppose that's to make up for the fact you can't legally hit anyone, right? As if I'd want to hit anyone. Violent. What a shame. I like a man who can take charge. Speaking of taking charge, are you sure you'll be able to keep up? You were a cat for an awfully long time. I know, but cats are very graceful creatures. I was a virtuoso even in my feline form. I have vague memories of Belle clamoring over the piano grating Clarice's home. Her paws pressing against the black and white keys and a coffee and noise. I laugh. Well, maybe you have a point. You look a lot cuter when you smile like that. You don't smile nearly enough, Robin. Uh, I haven't had too much to smile about recently. To tell you the truth, it feels a little bit strange. Maybe I fracture the muscles around my mouth. Well, I'm sorry if smiling is painful for you, but I won't let you off the hook. Not now when we've begun. I'm going to make you smile much, much more. Oh, you will, will you? When she says it like that, it sounds like a challenge. And I don't like backing down from challenges. quietly as the last notes fade into silence, pausing to brush a strand of her hair behind her ear. La Petite, La Petite Sweet should be a tad longer than our abridged version, but we don't have enough time. Lunch break will be ending soon, and then my classroom will be assailed by children again with their sticky fingers and gaming mouths. For a few moments, I almost managed to believe Bill and I were the only ones left on the planet. For a few moments, that's truly what I wanted. Turn back to reality someday. I think between you and I, we made a right mess of that. Well, it's been a while since I played anything that complicated. And it's been a while since.
since I had fingers. I apologize for being clumsy. That's fine. Even if you were clumsy, it was a very... passionate. Thank you. I'm always passionate in everything that I do. I can't understand humans who aren't. I drift through life like jellyfish, pale and gray, even though their lives are so much shorter than mine. Like Debussy. Yeah, like Debussy. I think it might be good he's dead, though. He'd be very upset that we butchered him the song. Bell smiles, coiling a strand of dark hair around one finger. Well, I would love to stay in chat, but I should probably be going now. I glance at Bell's impractical school uniform, a small smile on my face. I take it you have classes you need to attend. Of course. I'd love to hang around with my favorite teacher a little longer, but this girl is on a tight schedule. Playing the piano really wore me out. It did. All you had to do was move your fingers. I'm aware, but I'm still used to maintaining this form. I think I need a nap. You're sleepy at lunchtime? You really are like a cat. I was a cat until a few days ago. Now this cute kitty needs to recharge. Chew. I think I'm a little more perplexed for her outward shows of affection today. She leans forward on the stool. Not that she needs to go how close we are already, and presses a kiss against the tip of my nose, as light as a falling feather. But I still feel my face turning red. What is this anyway? I'm starting to feel like the school girl here, and I'm not even in the appropriate outfit, thank god. Belle gets to her feet and smiles, giving me a coquettish wave. Bye, Mr. Hawkins. I'll see you again soon. suspicious. Don't worry, nobody knows me coming in here, so I'm sure nobody will notice me leaving. You're awfully confident. Of course I'm confident. I was royalty in my last life, remember? Of course. And quicker than blinking, Belle slips through the window. I watch as she walks away, her dark hair fluttering around her shoulders. She disappears in less than a minute, as though she were never there at all. says when I returned home. Not, hello, how was your day? Or, you look tired, why don't you sit down? But, so what time do you call this? Though it's phrased as a question, I have enough sense to realize Sally means it in a strictly rhetorical sense. She knows what time it is already. Says so on the clock on the kitchen wall, as plain as day. Six, give or take, and the clock is a few minutes fast. It isn't a curious inquiry, it's an outright accusation. So, what's also worth pointing out here is inquiry. Earlier they spelled inquiry with an E. At first, I know if that was a British thing, but here they're spelling with an I, so I don't know if one of these is a typo. Look, I'm sorry, Sal. I know it's a little later than usual, but I couldn't help it. I had a staff meeting. A staff meeting? That's right. I told you about this morning, didn't I? Not that I recall, no. Are you sure I didn't? I could have sworn I did. It doesn't matter how much you swear, that doesn't change the fact that this meeting slipped your mind. Now, why is Sally making those little worm-shaped quotation marks with their fingers? I really was in a staff meeting. I didn't enjoy it one minute, and it was incredibly tedious, but that's what happened. What does she think I was doing? Does she really have that little faith in me? This is like the great novel position of last night all over again, and I'm in no hurry for a reprise of that. I'm sorry, Sally, I must have forgotten. I've been to so many of these damn meetings these last few weeks, it's hard to keep track of them all. And that is why you didn't look at your voicemail? Because you've been so damn bus busy? Voicemail? What are you talking about? I'm talking about Melly Robin. She was sent home from school early today. I had to go and pick her up. Wait, what? I thought Sally was just complaining for the sake of complaining, as she is so wont to doing nowadays. I didn't expect there to be a real valid point of criticism concealed amongst her words. Jeez, I must sound like a, such a hypocrite. There I was, complaining that Sally doesn't trust me when I don't trust her either. My parents argued a lot, too. Maybe that's where I learned all these tricks from. The bickering, the, sus the suspicion, the paranoia, the dislike. That's right, Millie hurt herself, Robin. She was acting distracted all day and kept falling asleep in class. Insomnia. I 
That's what Millie has, apparently. Then, in the middle of PE, she tripped and sprained her leg. She barely walked. She had to go home. And a sprained leg, too. Not to mention social anxiety, depression, and daily medication. Well, we try to tackle this one hurdle at a time. That's what Joan Fowler, Millie's psychiatrist, though according to Joan, she isn't a psychiatrist. She's a child welfare expert, says. I'm sorry, I didn't check my voicemail then. I didn't think. No, you never do, do you? Well, all the phones are banned in our school. For the students, I mean. Ever since Dylan Price pinched Phoebe Walker's iPhone. That children even need iPhones anyway. What are they? Seven? Eight? He's just talking about the price of the iPhone in hundreds of dollars. And what does that have to do with Melly? I just meant since the children are allowed to have phones at school, it set a pretty poor example if I had mine turned on all day. That may be the case, but you could have checked it when class ended. I know. I really am sorry, Sally. It totally slipped my mind. So how is Melly? When did she have PE? You don't know your daughter's own timetable? I hardly know my own timetable, Sally. I had the shock of my life just this afternoon when instead of class 2, year 6, I had class 3, year 1. I don't even know why you bother to the piano since those year 1 students can't carry a tune in a bucket. So you broke out the maracas again, did you? Against my better judgment, yes. Give them things that make lots of noise and they'll be happy. A small smile quirks the corners of Sally's lips. It flickers there uncertain, like a, glutter, like a guttering flame. She's still annoyed at me, but the mental image she must have had of being, me being overrun by screaming five-year-olds is so entertaining she can't stop herself from smiling. Well, a small smile is better than no smile, I suppose. Millie had P.E. in the afternoon. It was her second to last lesson of the day. So, she hasn't been back home for long. Not too long. She spent most of the time upstairs in her room. I think she's resting. You don't think Millie's sprained leg is anything life-threatening, do you? I'm sure she'll be fine come the morning. She hasn't any broken bones. The school nurse said it was fatigue. Fatigue. I wonder what she's doing to tire herself out so much. It's not like she ever leaves her room. Maybe homework. She's always been so anxious about her grades. She shouldn't worry so much. She's far smarter than I was when I was a kid. You should tell her that more often. It's probably because you don't praise her enough that she has such low self-esteem. Especially given those disastrous piano lessons. Were they really that bad? You made her cry? I might have done, but that was years and years ago. She's probably forgotten by now. I think you're under underestimating just how delicate Melly is. Maybe. I stretch. I feel slightly more at ease now that I know Melly is in a life-threatening danger. It was just a sprained leg, not even a broken bone. Do you think I should go and talk to her? Ask her if she's alright? I don't know if Millie's in the mood to talk to you right now. She's stressed enough as it is. So first you tell me I should pay more attention to my daughter, and now you say I should pay less. A man can't do both things at once, silly Sally. I know, it's just... it's complicated. You're making it more complicated than it needs to be. I just want to talk to my daughter, not find a cure for cancer. Sally sighs. I just think... If you really cared about Millie, you would have come back home earlier. And sincere. This again? I already told you, Sal. I was in a meeting. I can't do anything about that. I know that, Robin. But Melly might not. You've never bothered to explain it to her. I... I pause. My mouth hanging open. My self-righteous indignation cut short. Sally might have a point, given how really I speak to Melly. It's entirely probable that I never explained my circumstances to her before. Maybe this whole time, Melly was lying upstairs in her room, curled up in her bed, wondering where I was, thinking I didn't come because I didn't care, because I don't like her. But that isn't true. At least, I don't think it is. I can't deny that I find Melly hard work, but I do love her. She's my daughter. But I know I've been as far with Melly as I should be, but I don't know where to begin. I don't want to worry her. She doesn't need to know how busy I've been at work, or that the head keeps firing staff left, right, and center. I know how you feel, Robin, but Melly isn't a child. You should try to be more honest with her. But what good does honesty do? It just upsets people. But hiding things
is playing mind games hurts far more. And Spring Links too, I take it. It did look rather swollen. Did you put ice on it? Pack of frozen peas. I think it's gone down now. Well, that's good. Yeah, that's good. I stand in the corner of the kitchen. Write my options there with my like a paper through a printer. Naturally, I also like a paper through a printer. My thoughts keep getting jammed. I have to pause to manually reload them again and again. Right. I think I'll see Millie later after she's had a chance to rest up. Give her a couple of hours. I think I need some time to prepare myself. You need to prepare yourself to spend time with your daughter? Sure. All guys get anxious when they have to talk to pretty girls. Oh, you. Sally rolls her eyes, but at least she doesn't look annoyed. I forgot you were such a charmer. I laugh. I guess it's easy to forget. Marriage has domesticated me. A pause. You do think our marriage was a good thing, don't you? Of course. I wouldn't have agreed to it otherwise. We're just going through a rough patch, that's all. All couples have them. Oh, Sally. I sigh, suddenly overcome with emotion. Sally sounds like her old self again. Sally Paliona is tugging at that ponytail she always tied her hair back in. Or silly Sally when she said something ridiculous and I wanted to make her blush. She said we're going through a rough patch. She has no idea. Things might be rather more complicated than her cautious optimism leads her to believe. Okay, no skull and crossbones, no bullet holes, no drug paraphernalia. He's in a much better position than he believes himself to be. Melly. Hello, Melly. Are you awake? True to my words, a few hours have passed, and now I stand outside Melly's bedroom door. It's dark and the hallway is cloaked in shadow. It's kind of imposing. I feel like an unwanted intruder, an interloper, vampire-like. All I can do is wait for Melly's invitation to come inside. I can wait and wait and wait until hell freezes over, but I don't think that invitation is forthcoming. Melly doesn't reply. I rap again, my knuckles brushing against the wooden door. Melly? Melly's bedroom door is dark mahogany, framed by plum-covered wall plum-colored wallpaper. There's a small wooden plaque displayed on the door with displayed on the door above the brass doorknob, which reads Elodie in colorful letters. The M fell off a few years ago, leaving behind a strange, unfamiliar name. Still, despite my knocking, Melody doesn't answer. I'm not sure if she's really f asleep at seven in the evening. Yeah, right. Or if she's just ignoring me. All right, then. I'm coming in. Excuse me. And with a small apology, I take hold of the brass knob and turn it. <laughs> Melody's door opens slowly, creaking with each and every inch. I think the hinges might be starting to go. I step inside Melody's private quarters, her inner sanctum, and shut the door behind her. I used to go in Melody's room all the time when she was younger and to read picture books to her about Maisie the mouse and Connie the cat to help her not off to sleep. But that was a long, long time ago. When was the last time I came in here? Maybe it was a few months ago. Maybe it was more. I don't remember. Melody's room is dark. The light's off and curtains drawn. I can dimly make out shapes in the gloom. Millie's bookcase is stacked full of paperbacks, well thumbed through Philip Pullman's and J.K. Rawlings, and I can see familiar figures scattered across her desk. The droopy cottoners of a plush Betsy Bear lolling next to a beaten up old Connie cat who's missing one of her paws. Staying in this room almost feels like entering a time capsule, sealed off from the rest of time and space. I could be nine, ten years younger, and Millie could still be my cute little girl again. Still shy but not nearly as awkward. Maybe Melly loved me more back then. I think I might have loved her back more back then, too. I can see a small lump curled up underneath the covers and long black hair fanning out across the blue bedspread, now deep navy in the darkness. Melly's back is turned towards me, so I can't see her face. I'm not sure if I'm happy about this or not. What kind of expression she's making? Do I really want to know? Melly? I approach her slowly, cautiously, as a convict 
might when approaching the gallows, as Marie Antoinette must have done more than 200 years ago. Melly, are you asleep? A stupid question to ask, of course. If she really is asleep, she can't possibly answer. And if she isn't, then she must be pretending, so she won't reply to me anyway. As expected, she doesn't say anything. The silence stretches on. Look, I... I'm sorry for intruding, Melly. I won't stay for long. I think about taking a seat on her bed by Melly's side, but I don't. After such a long time of silence between the pair of us, I don't think we're ready for such a big commitment. Even so, I feel restless. I fish Betsy Barrett from Molly's desk. Melly's desk. For some reason, Connie Cat looks a little too intimidating for my longing, with her matted fur and missing paw. I turn her over in my hands just to give myself something to do. I just thought I should come here because I wanted to say I'm sorry. Melly doesn't stir. I didn't expect her to either, so that's just fine. I'm not sorry that you hurt your leg, mine, because I know that was just an unfortunate accident, and nobody's to blame for that, least of all you, Melly. I know it wasn't your fault. That doesn't say that I'm not worried about you, because I am. But I know you're a tough girl and you'll get well soon. Sally said it was only a sprain. You didn't even break a bone. Isn't that good? More silence. I know I'm rambling. It's a bad habit of mine. But I can't stop myself. This silence is pervasive creeping into the very interior of my skull like a thick smog, and I need to try and blot it out. Maybe if I can fill the room with the sound of my inane and articulate chatter, I can kid myself into thinking I'm having some kind of meaningful conversation with Melly. That this, whatever this is, might actually change something. I just... I'm sorry if I haven't been talking to you enough, Melly. I know I've been kind of distant, and it isn't your fault. I swear it isn't. I just... I've been really busy at work, and I know you're probably thinking, how could he be busy? He's just a music teacher. And I'm not mad about it. Everybody thinks it. Even Sally thinks it. The truth of the matter is, our school didn't do well in that last offset report, and a lot of parents have been complaining, and it, it's just kind of stressful. Not that I want to burden you with my own worries, of course, but I just wanted to let you know. That's why I haven't been around so much. It's not because of you, and it's not because I'm trying to avoid you. The thought never crossed my mind. Well, I suppose it crossed my mind just now. But it only crossed my mind in order to tell you that it didn't. I exhale heavily, squeezing the poor abused Betsy Bear to my chest. I wish I didn't have to feel anxious. What kind of grown man is scared of his own daughter? But I can't help it. I I'm sorry if I'm acting short with you too lately, Melly. That isn't your fault. It's mine. I'm just stressed, I suppose, and I... I'm sorry that we didn't get to go out last weekend. I know I promised, but I just got caught up with something. I know it doesn't make it better, and I... I really am sorry. And this really makes noise. It's so small that it could belong to a mouse, but I heard it clearly nevertheless. So Melly wasn't asleep after all. She really was listening to me. That, at least, is a little reassuring. If you want, we can go out this weekend, do something together like a family. How about that? Millie doesn't say anything in response, but I see her shift slightly under her duvet. Or duvet. Does that mean she's thinking about it? Yeah, it'll be fun. We haven't done anything together for a while, so it would be nice to get out of the house. We can go anywhere you want. To the zoo? For a walk? Maybe at the beach? I know how much you loved going to Whit Whitby when you were little. I don't know what Whitby is. Anyway, you don't need to come to a decision right now. Just think about it. If you want to go anywhere, just tell me or Sal. I'll sort it out for you. Millie still doesn't respond, but I think I've got her attention. I wonder if it's some kind of cruel genetic trick that, when I get anxious, I can talk forever. Whereas when Millie gets anxious, she can hardly force out a single syllable. We might be father and daughter, but I don't think we have that much in common. We're more like polar opposites, really. But even so, we are flesh and blood. We are related. I promise, Millie. You want to go out? We'll go out. You deserve it. You're my daughter, and I love you very much. I love her more than the words themselves can express. I think about giving Millie's head a pat, or hair a stroke, but I don't. Instead, I squeeze Betsy Bear tighter until her head collapses in on itself like a rotting fruit. <laughs>